Well, good morning, beloved church. If you would, please turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Loved ones, since the beginning of our study of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul has given us an insight, a keen insight into his heart. You know, like every true servant of the gospel, Paul uh, faced very difficult situations uh, throughout his ministry. Now, in the last couple of weeks, Paul has reminded us that hardships and suffering is part of our Christian walk as often uh, as, will, as God will allow. Now, though we may not like it, to go through these hard times, God knows that in every case, these trials help to make us stronger, to help us mature in our faith. Now, additionally, Paul teaches us by his own experience that oftentimes our Christian character will be called into question for varying reasons. This, we know that the world does to try and discredit our testimony and to discourage our faith, knowing that if he is successful in doing so, he could lead others to be discouraged in their faith as well. Now, last week, we learned that when this happens, we must therefore stand firm, grounded squarely and upon the Word of God and upon a clean, clear conscience. Now, when the apostles' sincerity and authority was questioned by those seeking to discredit his word and his work, Paul appealed to his proven integrity and to his past record in speaking the truth in love. When Paul said no, he meant no. When he said yes, he meant yes. Sadly, however, there were some within the Corinthian church that were trying to discredit him and gain Paul's followers onto themselves. Now, defending his integrity, Paul states the primary reason why he didn't return to Corinth as he had expected. At the beginning of chapter 2, Paul says, But I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. Here we see that Paul stresses why he didn't come to Corinth, when he said he was planning on coming. It was for their own good. It was for their own sake. Paul had the Corinthians' well-being in mind. And you know, and as a responsible shepherd, Paul's main concern was for his flock. He knew that if he had gone back to Corinth, he would undoubtedly had had to deal harshly with members of the church, for they were in sin. Now, this does not mean that Paul shun away. It doesn't mean that he avoided dealing with sinful issues in the Corinthian church. For we know that Paul did, did deal with them, uh, with such issues. For example, in 1 Corinthians, in the letter that we are studying in Sunday school. And we also know that there was a third letter, the one between 1 and 2 Corinthians, hence lost, where he, uh, that which he used to, to, uh, to call them to account. Now, this is a letter that we refer to as a painful letter in which Paul dealt heavily and directly with some of the major sin issues plaguing the Corinthian church at that time. Now, as we continue in our study of 2 Corinthians in chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, Paul moves now to address an incident with a Christian brother. We know it's a brother because, as we will see, he references him as a he. Apparently, this man had a problem with the Apostle Paul and hurt the Apostle Paul severely, as well as the church. Now, the consensus among biblical commentators is that during this short visit to Corinth, after Paul sent them what we know now as 1 Corinthians, Paul was sinfully confronted by a man who had been influenced by Paul's detractors. Now, let's let's not, not forget that very often, after a uh, Paul would found a church, um, and he would leave, 
detractors would come shortly after and seek to discredit uh, and not only the integrity of the, of the messenger, of the church planter, but sadly, by extension, the integrity of the word that had been taught and seek to undo the very work that the Apostle Paul in fi- uh, founding churches had uh, accomplished. So there's no surprise that after he left Corinth, detractors would come to try to sway people against the truth that they had heard. That is how the enemy works. Now, this man apparently questioned Paul's apostolic authority and pastoral integrity, and he did it publicly. Now, sadly, the Corinthian church did nothing. The church's sinful response of not standing up for Paul and calling such a person to account was one of the topics that Paul addresses in this severe letter, hence lost. Now, Paul brings up the, this incident not because he had a grudge against this offender or even a bone to pick with the Corinthian church at large, but instead to provide further instruction on how to deal with an offender who has repented. By the grace of God, the church in Corinth had repented and had exercised church discipline on the sinning brother, which was righteous and proper. Through the discipline of the church, this erring brother, this sinning brother, came to repentance as well, but apparently the church was hesitant in their forgiveness of him. Paul then in our text will caution the church that their discipline may have gone a little too far. You see, it was proper that the church exercise discipline over a sinning member as long as they did not forget the twofold purpose of church discipline. First, being the purity of the church. And secondly, the restoration of the repentant person to Christian fellowship. Now, before going on to read our text, let us answer the question, what is church discipline? Church discipline is when the church exercises its biblical mandate based on love to glorify God in keeping the church pure by addressing sin within the body. Specifically, when a brother or sister is in sin, it is the loving responsibility of fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to approach such a person and make them aware of their sin and have them stop, repent, and, and, and seek God's forgiveness so that the body of Christ, the church, remains healthy and empowered for the work that God has for the church. Now, sadly, beloved, for many churches, church discipline is a foreign concept. Whereas for churches like ours, to God be the glory, Not only the concept, but the steps of church discipline are clearly delineated in our Constitution and bylaws. I think I checked a couple of days ago, out of a 29-page document, six of those pages speak directly to church discipline. Now, when it comes to church discipline, as with other doctrinal issues, there are unhealthy extremes. Take the early church, particularly seen uh, within uh, the, the Catholic church. Tremendous abuse of church discipline or tremendous abuse under the guise of church discipline where they focus more on penance with no guarantee of, re- guarantee of, re- of restored fellowship. It was more punitive than restorative. They were seeking to punish rather than to restore. 
to the point that there would be extreme physical violence done to a person because of their sin. They would be excommunicated be to, the, to the point of, of, of no, not being allowed to return. <clears throat> Yet the other extreme, which I suggest to you is far more prominent and extreme, is no church discipline at all. So we see both extremes. But I would suggest to you now more so is the no church discipline at all extreme. Now this extreme is most dangerous, beloved, you know why? Because there is nothing more detrimental to the purity and the purpose of the church than dealing lightly with sin in the church. Nothing will topple a church faster than allowing sin to remain unchecked. Now, as I already mentioned, by God's grace, not only did most of the Corinthian church repent for not dealing with this sinning brother earlier, but even the city man himself repented of the way he treated the apostle Paul. This was obviously great news, for as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he writes to caution them against non-biblical excessive discipline. So with that said, beloved, I invite you now to follow along as we read our text for this morning and then seek the Lord's blessing upon our study. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 beginning in verse 5. Paul continues by saying, But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority so that, on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also, for indeed what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Father in heaven, again, we rejoice for this privilege given to us this morning to come into this sanctuary to read your word, to sing out loud, to pray. And now, Father, to sit under the exposition of your holy word. Father, how we pray that through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, you would grant us discernment, understanding, that we may understand in order that we may obey. For you are our Lord, and we are your slaves. Therefore, we pray now that you go before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, this morning, we are going to look at three principles of biblical church discipline. Three principles of biblical church discipline with the goal of understanding why biblical church discipline is so important for the proper function of the church of Christ. Now, as we look at verse 5, I want us to look at the first principle, which is the extent of sorrow that sin brings. The extent of sorrow that sin brings. Paul says, if anyone has caused sorrow, and you can read this, you could not go wrong by inserting, and there has been, and such a person has brought sorrow. If any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, not in, in order not to say too much to all of you. So here in our text, Paul mentions a particular person, a particular man, who had apparently wronged Paul 
and in so doing, the church at Corinth as well. What sin this man committed, we are not entirely sure. However, most scholars and commentators believe that this man, perhaps a leader of the mounting group against Paul, had publicly opposed Paul when he made an emergency visit to Corinth after Timothy gave Paul an extremely worrisome report on the condition of the church. Paul was perhaps uh, not only publicly confronted by this man, but this man was at the same time questioning Paul's integrity and his ministry motives. Now others believe, just in case this was in your mind, others believe that the man spoken of here in 2 Corinthians 6 is the same man spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. The man who was engaged in immorality with his father's wife, whom Paul was astonished, was not kicked out of the church already, but allowed to remain in fellowship even while engaged in such public sin. Now, I agree with most commentators that the man Paul speaks of here in verse 6 is a different person. Mainly because whomever this man was, sinned directly against the Apostle Paul. Whereas the man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 did not sin directly against the Apostle Paul. Now, ultimately, the identity of this man is not the point. So I don't want us to camp too much there. The issue is, how is the church handling this man who has already been disciplined? After Paul sent his sorrowful letter after his painful visit, we see that the Corinthian church repented for not standing up for the Apostle Paul when he was confronted and when he was harassed. How do we know this? Well, you're already in 2 Corinthians. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Just to give you a little background. As to what we're talking about here. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 5 through 9. Paul writing to the church. He says, for even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had not rest. But we were afflicted on every side. Conflicts without without, fierce within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming by also, but by the comfort with which he was comforted in you, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoice even more. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter cost you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance, for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. Okay, back to chapter 2. There's just a little glimpse as to, now that Paul knows that that church had repented, and likewise, the man who has sinned against him directly had repented. He is now writing back to them and wanting to talk to, to them about their discipline of this man. Now, the church was correct, again, in exercising discipline on this particular man, just as Paul admonished them to do with the previous man in 1 Corinthians 5. In essence, the church learned its lesson. We see sin, it needs to be addressed, and discipline must follow. Now, why was the church correct in exercising church discipline? Simply, simple, because sin has consequences. In the case of the man that Paul addressed here in verse 5, Paul acknowledged that when the man, what the man did not only affected Paul, but to some degree affected the church at, la at large. In other words, using uh, Philip's paraphrase, Paul says, if the behavior of a certain person has caused distress, it does not mean so much that he has injured me, but that to some extent, and I don't wish to exaggerate, he has injured all of you. 
How true is that, beloved? One of the horrible consequences of sin is the extent of the sorrow it brings, not only to the person to, to whom sin was, was uh, committed first, but also to the church at large, to other people. When this man sinned against Paul, he also sinned against the church by causing division. He sinned by being used as an instrument of Satan to cast discord among the brethren by publicly and sinfully confronting one of Christ's chosen apostles. Now, if we know anything about the Apostle Paul, he was not claiming his authority simply because he was an apostle. He could have, as he will tell us later, he could have said, hey, did Jesus pick you out? Did he call you? Did he hand pick you for this work? No, he didn't, so be quiet. No, he wasn't like that. He never pushed his authority upon people. Although he was never ashamed of claiming his authority because he did have authority from the Lord. So this man was causing division and discord among the church. This is sinful. Especially when you consider Psalm 133, verse 1, where it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Because of this man's sin, the church was not dwelling in unity. They were doubting their founders, Paul's authority. And worse, if they questioned Paul's word, and as a mouthpiece of God himself, they were questioning God's word. They were questioning God himself. Again, this man sinned by causing this unity and ushering doubt on the apostolic authority of the man God used to plant the church. Now, by God's grace, however, this man was ultimately disciplined by the church after the church had itself repented for not taking a stand earlier against this man. Now, as we draw our attention to uh, uh, verse, uh, this, this verse here, Paul reminds us that when it comes to church discipline, we understand that there is a, a, an effect that affects more than just the person to whom sin was committed first. It expands. There's... There's a, it, it, it sorrow extends to more than just a person. Now, as we move on to look at this next verse then, Paul reminds us that when it comes to church discipline, there is a point of sufficiency that must be reached. So yes, the extent of sorrow, sin, the, 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 the extent of sorrow that sin brings affects the whole, not only some, and therefore sin must be addressed. Thus refusing, those refusing to uh, repent must be biblically disciplined, which may include excommunication, that is, removing them from the fellowship, but may hopefully not. Nevertheless, the church must also take care not to, not to exceed um, a biblical level when exercising such discipline. So, Again, we have the extent of sorrow that sin brings in verse 5, and now we move to the second principle of biblical church discipline, and that is that there is a level of sufficiency as we see here in verse 6. Notice what Paul says, Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. Loved ones, here we get a beautiful glimpse of the apostle Paul's heart, his pastoral heart. Yes, this man sinned against him and the church. But what must be remembered is that this man has since uh, repented. He had repented. So here we see Paul's heart is for this brother. Here Paul contends for the sufficiency of this punishment, of the punishment that this man has already received. Interestingly, the Greek word translated punishment here in this verse only occurs once. And it means to punish with the implication of causing people to suffer what they deserve. Now it also carries the idea of censure, which is a formal act or expression of criticism and rebuke. <laughs> 
Now also note that this formal act was inflicted by the majority of the church, which tells us that this was an official and public act. This man's discipline, this man's punishment. Now, as to the implication of the term majority, this is interesting. Some believe that there was a small minority that wanted a more severe punishment to befall this brother for what he did. Now, nevertheless, Paul says that whatever punishment, whatever rebuke, whatever censure, it was sufficient. My beloved, I need you to listen to the following quote by S. Lewis Johnson very carefully. For I believe it gets to the heart of what true biblical church discipline entails. He says, there is a difference between hurting someone and harming someone. It is sometimes necessary to hurt in order to avoid harming. Let me read that again. There is a difference between hurting someone and harming someone. It is sometimes necessary to hurt in order to avoid harming. And I believe, beloved, that this comes in line specifically with Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6, which says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an, em of, of an enemy. If we could understand that concept, Beloved, I suggest to you we understand genuine biblical church discipline. There's a difference between hurting somebody and harming somebody. Sometimes you have to hurt somebody in order to keep them from harm. Yes, sin has to be dealt with, and many times pain is involved as sin is dealt with, especially in the church. How many of you have ever been confronted by a loving brother or sister in the Lord in regards to your sinfulness, your sin against that person? I have, and it feels horrible. It hurts. It's very painful. But as a true believer, one must recognize that this is an act of mercy by God to send such a loving brother or sister to tell you and to needfully cause you pain in order to keep you from further harm. It doesn't feel good, but it's necessary. We know that this must be done, regardless of how painful the experience is, knowing that the church, the vitality, its purity, depends on dealing and confronting sin directly. For only after that, healing can come. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, we need to avoid extremes in church discipline. One is no discipline at all, and the other is discipline that is too severe. Focus more on punishment rather than restoration. This could have been the issue with the majority, not the, I mean the minority, the majority had inflicted such punishment. The minority probably wanted more severe punishment. Here, I think some were trying to focus more on a punitive punishment rather than a restorative viewpoint of church discipline. So here, Paul is reminding the Corinthian church that whatever discipline this man experienced, it was sufficient. In other words, it's time to back off. This brother has had enough. So yes, we see the extent of sorrow that sin brings. We see that there's a level of sufficiency that church discipline must arrive at. 
Now, this leads us to the third principle of biblical church discipline, this being the goal, which we find in verses 8 and 9. Seven, I mean, uh, verses 7 and 8. The goal, the goal of church discipline is forgiveness, comfort, and restoration. That is the goal of church discipline. Forgiveness, comfort, and restoration. Notice what verse 7 says as he continues. When he says, well, go, go back to verse 6. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted the majority. So that, verse 6, so that on the contrary... You should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. So here in Capsulated, we see what the goal for church discipline is. It's so that the person can, bring, can be brought to forgiveness, so he can be comforted and ultimately reaffirmed by the body. Now, loved ones, please note that here Paul gives us again a threefold goal of threefold goal of biblical biblical discipline. The goal of church discipline is to bring the offender to repentance, so that he may receive forgiveness, comfort, and ultimately rest restoration. Again, biblical church discipline is not so much punitive than restorative. That is why Paul in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Beloved, I suggest to you that the Corinthian church was not doing that with this man. They were going to the extremes. Yes, this man hurt Paul. Yes, this man by extension hurt the church and may have caused division. But there comes a time after a man has repented that enough is enough. Ephesians 4, 32. Paul says, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Paul continues in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, when he says, Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, you also forgive them. And listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12, verse 11, where he says, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Do you, do you hear what church discipline should yield? The peaceful fruit of righteousness. Apparently for this man, for whom Paul is standing uh, with, with whom he's standing. He's saying, I don't think this man is feeling the peaceful fruit of righteousness that should come from, from the discipline that he, that, that, that he received and after repenting. Now, loved ones, please note why Paul says that the repentant offender must be forgiven, comforted, and restored. Middle of verse 7. Why? Otherwise, Paul says, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Beloved, can you imagine if after confessing your sin before God and He forgives you, He says, I forgive you, but I don't want to be with you anymore. I don't want you around. I mean, you won't go to hell, but I don't like you. I want to be with you. An example we find in the Bible, although it's not a righteous example, is Judas. Think about him. Obviously, he wasn't saved. He was Satan incarnate. But think of the overwhelmed, the overwhelming sense of sorrow that man had to the degree that he took his own life. Now, unfortunately, this sorrow didn't lead to his repentance. But I think a point could be made. There is a point 
beloved, where a man or a woman could get to become so overwhelming in their sorrow that is beyond excess. So that is why it's important that the church, when exercising church discipline, know that there is a level of sufficiency and be ready, be quick to forgive, to comfort, and to restore a sinning brother or sister, regardless of the sin. Yes, I know that there are some sins whereby somebody might say, yes, we forgive him, but we don't want him anywhere near us. We forgive her, but I don't want we don't want to be near that person. And to that I must ask, to that type of attitude, is that biblical? That we would not be quick to pray and to seek for that person's repentance? Should we not be quick to grant our forgiveness once repentance is evident? And bring him back into the fold to love on them and comfort them, knowing that they could be so overwhelmed by excessive sorrow? Oh, far be it from us, beloved, to think that there could be such a person that can sin so grievously, who forfeits their the possibility, forfeits the possibility to ever be granted fellowship back into the fold. Now also note, when it comes to forgiveness, comfort, and restoration, please note in verse 9 that it is a matter of obedience. It is a matter of obedience. This is a sub-point of that third principle. For to this end, Paul says, I also wrote so that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Again, I just read you quotes from where Paul in Ephesians and Colossians um, uh, speaks of how it is that we ought to be with one another, be, really, be ready to forgive and to act with gentleness toward one another. It's a matter of obedience. He's writing to put him to the test. What are you going to do, church, with this brother who is now repentant? What are you going to do with him? You need to forgive him. You need to comfort and restore him. This forgiveness and comfort restoration also comes with uh, comes from godly motives. This we see in verse 10 and 11. Notice that in verse 10, we see that Paul puts this person first. Notice. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. He's not thinking of himself. He was directly affected by the sin of this man, but he's not putting himself first. He said, look, if there's anything that I've done, if I've forgiven this man, which he has, I did it for your sakes. I did it as an example to you. He offended me directly. And yeah, that affected the church indirectly, but I'm serving as an example to you. I forgave him. And I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. And notice that this was done in order not to give Satan an opportunity to divide. Notice verse 11. So that. Why did he do that? Why did he forgive this man? Why did he say that I did this for your sake? So that. No advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now let me ask you a question. How is it that Satan divides? He has many schemes, but how is it that Satan divides? First, he divides by seeking to make God's people doubt God's word. That's what he was trying to do through this man when he confronted the Apostle Paul. Discredit the mouthpiece of God. And how does he do that? Again, by casting doubt. Which clearly teaches the importance of dealing with sin. You have to deal with it. There's no doubt about that. When God's word says, 
that sin must be addressed and must be addressed. But guess what also God's word says? God's, God's word mandates forgiveness. Can you see how Satan can use the unforgiveness of this church towards this man? The harsh treatment of this church towards this man to divide the church. Paul says, we are not ignorant of those schemes, church. We are not ignorant. Oh, beloved, let us never forget that our Savior came, what he came to do when he came to this earth. He came to save those who were lost. And how did he do that? By taking to himself the punishment that we deserve. And by atoning for our sin by the shedding of his blood. Jesus came to forgive, to comfort, and restore. Now with this in mind, beloved, I want you to think. When are you most like your Savior? Could it be when you do likewise? Could it be that you are most like your Savior when you forgive? When you comfort and restore? You want to be like Jesus? Be like Jesus. You know, the same goes for the church. This is how the church should view church discipline. Church discipline, when biblically practiced, restores purity for sure. Let's not forget that. It restores purity to the church along with the power that comes with such purity to do God's work. The discipline of the church, by the, 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 the discipline... Uh, of the church, by the church, is also commanded by Scripture as a sign of Christian love towards one another. Church discipline then ought to be ex exercised for the good of the sinning member of the body, uh, for, for, and for the good of the church. Obviously, all for the glory of God. So here again, beloved, Paul shows us three principles of church discipline. First, the extent of sorrow that sin brings. We also saw that there's a level of sufficiency when it comes to church discipline. And third, there's a goal, the goal being forgiveness, comfort, and restoration. And under that, these are just a matter of obedience. They come from godly motives, putting others first, and understanding that to fail in this regard could put us in jeopardy of the schemes of Satan as he's seeking to devour, as he's seeking to divide. Church, may the Lord empower us to take heed of his word as it pertains to church discipline. Now, for those that may be in our audience that may not know Christ as Savior and Lord, who perhaps have not ever experienced what we talked about, forgiveness, comfort, and restoration, we know full well, beloved, that unless a person repents from their sin, there is no forgiveness, no comfort, and no restoration. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, I ask that you would consider your place before a holy God. I pray that God, through His Holy Spirit, would make you aware of your sin, and even beyond that, draw you to confess your sin, repent of your sin, and ask for his forgiveness. Knowing that he is ready and willing to give that gift to you. So if that is you today, I pray that you would cry out for Christ. If you don't know what that looks like or what that even means, I'd ask that you would remain after church and, and uh, I'll be up front. You can speak to me and we can talk about that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning, and we thank you for your word as we consider perhaps a different aspect of church discipline that we may be used to. Father, we thank you that you call us to take sin seriously, to deal with it, as painful as it may be, for the sake of the purity and the soundness of the church. But Lord, also, we thank you for the reminder that when a person is disciplined, understand that the purpose is to be restorative. The, guard, the church also needs to guard against being too severe. Father, we pray that 
you keep us from ever having to exercise church discipline, but if we do have to, we ask that you would also make us make us ready and, and give us a yearning to seek to forgive, to comfort and restore whomever it is that the church must discipline. Father, thank you for reminding us that there is a there's a limit. We pray that as we seek to obey your word and be as biblical as possible, that you keep us from erring to each degree. Again, Lord, we do thank you so much for your word and ask now that you be glorified as we go forth this day, continue to worship you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.